I'm Patrick Denard from Medford, Oregon. I want to share with you my algorithm for graft augmentation of repairable rotator cuff tears and give you a little explanation of why and when I will use dermal allograft augmentation. We have previously summarized this explanation in this paper we published in the Arthroscopy Journal entitled The Graft Augmentation of Repairable Rotator Cuff Tears, where we outlined an algorithmic approach for the use of dermal allograft augmentation. And when we have repairable rotator cuff tears, we can use the rotator cuff healing index to define or predict their healing preoperatively without dermal allograft. That cutoff that we defined in this paper was seven points, and I'll explain that science as we go along. So first of all, how are we doing overall with rotator cuff tears? Secondly, what are the tools that we can use to predict healing that we're going to get into with that rotator cuff healing index? And then lastly, I want to touch on what are the tissue options? So how are we doing? You can see over the last several decades, we've had in a dramatic explosion in the number of rotator cuff repair articles that have been published. And we've gotten better with healing, as you can see, moving left to right in that red line that goes across. But still, we have a lot of room to improve. We still have about 25% of our patients that are not getting healing with good rotator cuff repairs. And that's important because functional outcome is correlated with rotator cuff integrity. Meta-analysis here of 800 patients, you see 22% again had re-tear and ASCS scores were higher in the patients that healed compared to those that did not. This is another study, it's smaller, but I like this study because this 10-year follow-up looked at double row constructs and they very clearly found at 10-year time point that if the tears had not healed, they had lower functional outcomes and higher pain scores compared to the patients who did have healing. So clearly, we want to do everything we can to achieve rotator cuff healing. So what tools can we use to predict that healing? There's a lot of factors, and sometimes it feels quite overwhelming. We have tear size, we have fatty infiltration, we have repair factors, and we have patient factors. What we want to try to do is put this into a predictive model to really give some science to what the chances of the patient is for healing. There's a couple of attempts at this. This is a study by George Morrell out of Australia. Over 1,900 patients, they looked at several factors. The most important factor they found in this study was anterior-posterior tear length. And they developed an equation looking at other factors such as case number, patient age, hospital type, repair quality that they could use to predict healing as well. But this is a study that I really like because this really drills this down into what I find a more clinically useful equation. This study out of Korea looked at 603 patients with full thickness rotator cuff tears. All of these were primary repairs. They had post-operative MRIs or CT scans at one year post-operatively. 61% of the patients had double row repairs. So we have confidence these are good constructs. Despite that, their overall retear rate was 24%, similar to what we saw earlier. And they identified several significant factors as you would expect, retraction, age, infraspinatus fat infiltration. But they took that one step further and develop this rotator cuff healing index. And as you can see here, there's several factors that are correlated with healing. Age, for instance, increasing age, age over 70, you got two points. AP tear size over 2.5 centimeters, you get another two points. Retraction, they divide that down into a couple of different segments there, but as you can see, over three, you have four points total. And then infraspinatus fat infiltration grade two or greater is three points as well. And then also activity and bone mineral density. So when we divide these, patients have four points or less, they had a 94% chance of healing. And then it starts to drop off. Over five points, 45% chance of healing. Over 10 points, 14% chance of healing. So let's look at these numbers more closely. And what you see when you really drill down is that you see a dramatic drop off after about six points. We really take a nosedive off a cliff here where healing drops from 66% to 38% and then 25%. So that point for me is the point where I think we get the greatest benefit from intervening. Let's look at some case examples here. 71-year-old patient, so over 70, they have two points. Tear retraction greater than three centimeters, four points total. Now, if we have infraspinous infiltration of even grade two, but grade three in this case, we have three points. So we have nine points total, pretty simple to put together. But you see, we are going to have healing of less than 30%. Here's another case example, 55-year-old patient. So no points for age, but if they have even a three by 2.5 centimeter tear, they're going to have four points for their tear size based on the AP size and the retraction. And if they have fatty infiltration of grade two or greater, they would get three more points, which would put them at seven. And then if they're a high activity worker, 
nine points total. So this patient would have less than a 30% chance of healing. And I would make a strong argument in this young patient, you would want to do everything you can do to achieve healing to optimize their long-term outcome. So in summary, healing improves functional outcome. Healing decreases with increasing fat infiltration, tear size, and age. And we can use predictive modeling to aid in calculating the risk. So let's next look at what are the tissue options. Remember the mode of failure. The weak link in rotator cuff repair is the tissue, right? Suture pulls through tissue rather than anchors pulling out of the bone in the majority of cases. So we want to optimize our fixation and our biology. And we have two primary options. On one hand, we have dermal allograft options. On the other hand, we have xenograft options. With dermal allograft, we have a long history of use. With xeno allograft, we have a cloudy history. In the past, we've had problems previous, and we're seeing that reemerge now. We also have differences in the DNA. With dermal allograft, we have 97% of the DNA removed. With xenograft patches, we have non-human DNA. What do the studies show on this? This is a basic science study by Jimmy Cook. They looked at 16 dogs. They compared debridement, amnion, dermal allograft, and bovine patch. Looked at clinical outcomes in these canine models at three and six months. They did an extensive study with MRI, histology, and biomechanics. And the bottom line is that when they compared debridement alone to the use of tissue augmentation, tissue augmentation improved outcomes. However, they saw inflammatory reactions in the bovine patch group, which I would suspect is related to that DNA issue that we talked about before. So in summary, canine models, they prefer dermal allograft over bovine patches. What about the biomechanics? We know from this study at a Mayo Clinic published several years ago that load to failure of a rotator cuff repair is improved with the use of dermal allograft augmentation. Other studies have had similar findings. This is a study here looking at massive rotator cuff repairs, retrospective, but they compared 54 conventional repairs to cases in which they use a dermal allograft patch. And you can see 81% healing compared to 54% without. What about on the other side on using xenograft? We also see signs of inflammatory reactions bearing out. For instance, in this study published by Buddy Savoie, 96% of the patients had healing. However, 35% had, quote, scapular dyskinesis requiring prolonged therapy and bracing, which I would suspect is related to postoperative stiffness. Overall, in summary, we know that the highest rates, if you look at systematic review, are with allograft. After that, it drops off to xenograft and then finally dropping off to non-augmented repairs. So let's remember these healing rates and go back to that concept we developed earlier at the rotator cuff healing index. And remember, there's a sharp drop off after about six points where healing drops from about 66% to 30% or less. So let's look at a case example here. 65-year-old patient, zero points based on age. But if they have a tear size of even 2.5 by 2 centimeters, they would have four points based on their AP tear size and retraction. And if they have fat infiltration of even grade two, they'd have three more points for seven points. So you would predict that a patient like this is an approximately 30% chance of healing with conventional means. And I would make the argument that if you want to optimize this patient's outcome long-term, you want to do everything you can with the use of dermal allograft augmentation. So in conclusion, rotator cuff healing can be predicted preoperatively. You can use these tools to get a sense of what your patient's odds are of healing. The best evidence for tissue augmentation supports the use of human dermal allograft when you look at basic science to biomechanical to clinical outcomes published in the literature. So my approach currently is to use the rotator cuff healing index, and I use seven as a cutoff to preoperatively counsel my patients on the use of cuff mend as a means to augment their repair long-term. Thank you.